Is that better? Hey, look, it works when you turn it on. Mike is hot. I'm clearly not. <laughs> I know you said I sound more wakeful and focused in the afternoon, but I'm really not seeing how this is possible. <laughs> we may have to do something about making sure you actually get enough sleep. Coffee is not an adequate substitute. This week on the Play Ed Podcast, we dive into Roman mythology with By Jove by Aristoplay. Welcome to the Play Ed Podcast, where we explore cultivating connections through play. Hello and welcome to the Play Ed Podcast. I'm your host, Laura. And I'm Chris. And we're here today to explore cultivating connections through play. So, before I get started, I wanted to again remind our listeners that if you are listening to us on Apple Podcasts, please rate and review us. It does help new folks find us more easily. Um, And please, uh, wherever you're listening to us, share us with your friends, share us with your enemies, spread the word. So, I had been intending this week that we were going to explore um, the Avalon Hill board game... um, Circus Maximus. Circus Maximus. Well, (laughs) I disassembled our entire recording studio slash office yesterday hunting for the game chits. I can find the board, but not the pieces. The board's hanging up in the closet, but all the game pieces have gone missing. Yes. So I had a wonderful opportunity to do a ton of decluttering, but I still can't find the game. Thankfully, we had a backup. So today, we are going to be going deeper into uh, By Jove by Aristoplay. So, Laura, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about By Jove, which is a charming game that I don't even remember when or how I discovered it. Actually, I can tell you exactly how we discovered it. So both of us were Latin nerds. Well, still are. Still are. But more importantly, when we met in college, that was one of the things that we discovered is, hey, we studied Latin. One of my roommates... That and Highlander. Well, yes. (laughs) (laughs) Not Outlander, Highlander. Yes. Anyway... One of my roommates uh, also was a Latin nerd, so much so that she decided to go ahead and major in it. And when uh, she did, she had all kinds of tales about doing Latin in her high school, including to going to Latin conventions, where they did things like play games like By Jove, because they have a focus on Roman mythology. So that's, I'm pretty sure, how we discovered it. I think that was one of the games that she had either played in high school or used with her own Latin students. But it is, as I mentioned, by Arista Play. It was from 1983. It's currently out of print, but copies can be found fairly easily on eBay. Uh, And I'm currently exploring whether or not the current holder of the copyright is planning to uh, reprint or not. I will update on a further episode if we get news on that. The game itself has got a fairly... If you're familiar with Monopoly, then the gameplay is going to make a lot of sense. It's a roll dice to advance around a square game board that has a number of different pieces uh, of uh, places that are drawn from Roman mythology. Uh, Greco-Roman, since a lot of them take place in Greek, but the naming conventions are primarily Roman. You're looking at... Venus and Neptune rather than um, Aphrodite and, uh, help me here. Poseidon. Poseidon. Thank you. Poseidon. Poseidon. Uh, Aeneas puts in an appearance as one of the heroes. Um, I can't remember if uh, Odysseus is listed as Ulysses on the board. I think he is. Yes, he's listed as Ulysses Ulysses on the board. So greco-roman but but as the name of the game by jove would imply it's definitely more the the roman take on a lot of these these stories in this mythology so as i mentioned it has a gameplay very similar to monopoly you roll the dice you advance around the board you collect cards however it's got a couple of extra complications to it 
complications in a good way, like watch making, you know, watch mechanics are complications. Yes, it gives a couple of additional elements to the gameplay besides merely collecting cards and, uh, you know, you're not building hotels. What you are doing is collecting gold coins, and it comes with a charming little collection of plastic uh, gold-colored coins. Uh, you also have to collect eight Vanquish Apparel Awards, one Labyrinth Award, and one Quest Award. As a result, the game board is a little on the busy side, uh, but in a good way. You've got around the edges where you would have properties and Monopoly, you have a group of all kinds of interesting things like heroes, perils, um, oracles. Uh, you have a uh, number of heroines, even some superheroes. Like uh, Superman? Well... In a way, yes. <laughs> That's okay, no, no. To be clear, Superman does not show up, n nor do most of your comic book superheroes show up in this game. But if you want to introduce your children to the idea that long before Marvel and DC existed, people were telling tales about people endowed with astounding powers, this is probably a great place to begin. You have as I mentioned on the exterior, a number of different places where you would have properties. In the center of the board, along with your Oracle and Potluck cards, which play the same role that... Uh, Chance and Community Chest. Oh, do. You also have a Labyrinth and a... Uh, quest for the Golden Fleece. Quest for the Golden Fleece, based on, on, based on the Voyage of the Argo. So, I think based on that, it's a pretty good way to look into what on earth does this game teach. Yeah. And the first obvious point is that this is going to teach an awful lot of Roman mythology. In fact, to aid the um, parent or teacher who's leading the game... Since this game was explicitly designed as edutainment, uh, that was Arista Plays and still is Arista Plays focus mm -hmm. um, in the games that they produce and sell. By Jove comes not merely with an instruction book, but a whole host of stories. So if you don't happen to have a series of Greek or Roman uh, mythology in your house, you can have a quick ready reference to all of the um, myths and stories of the name, what's the background and relationship between all of the various heroes and gods and goddesses that show up on the game board. So the booklet that comes with the game and all the game pieces contains the playing instructions, contains a very brief pronunciation guide, some recommendations for further reading, um, including uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne's A Wonder Book uh, for Boys and Girls, and Tanglewood Tales, um, some of Olivia Coolidge's work, Pedrick Collins' The Children's Homer, which I know is a favorite of our kids. Mm -hmm. um, all of those are... Um, underlying the summaries and they're very very brief summaries included in the bulk of this uh booklet that help fill out who are these characters that are illustrated on the board and what are these adventures um that the game is about now the presumption is that you're either doing this in context with reading about these things or telling these stories I know for our kids, we've read Dal Lair's book of Greek myths to them. Um, as I said, they've read uh, and, and listened to the audiobook of the Children's Homer by Pedrick Collum, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. So this integrates really, really neatly mm -hmm. um, as part of an overall curriculum, but it's also beautifully supplementary because even if your kid, your children are in um, a, a more conventional schooling situation, and they're not covering a lot of Greek and Roman mythology. This Playing the board game and reading through the summaries that come with the book, or uh, with the game, um, create an opportunity to have those discussions. It creates a good en entry point into it. Um, and one of the other things that I love is the artwork on the game board is stunning. Uh, it's very stylized and reminiscent of Greek pottery. So if you're trying to help... Although all the figures are clothed. Yes. They... Which, which is not necessarily the case with Greek pottery. Well, Polyphemus is... Nothing is showing that would be awkward. Let me put it that way. <laughs> but... Yes, but Polyphemus is a cyclops. So... That is true. <clears throat> so 
they um but the it helps to if you're tra- trying to develop aesthetic sense of recognizing um different periods of artwork it's going to help you develop that idea of the style of artwork that you would find in the greek world that the romans were so very fond of um because the romans had some of their own myths and then they adopted and integrated into their world a lot of the greek myths but they loved greece um and we're fascinated by it. They, we are certainly not the first culture that looks to others and says, wow, everyone else is so much cooler than us. So This was a problem the Romans definitely had. Oh, most certainly. Cultural envy. Mm-hmm. It's a thing. Uh, you definitely get the opportunity to dive deeply into two particular stories through the labyrinth and quest uh, elements of the game. Uh, so if you're looking to dive deeper, you've got the opportunity to look into those. But what's interesting, to my mind, is that if you're doing a deeper study of history, both of these become interesting because with the labyrinth, you have the opportunity to dive into a place of this proves a good intro point to looking into the archaeological remains on Crete, particularly the excavation of the palace at Knossos. And you have the opportunity to look at the voyage of the Argo and uh, the possible historical foundations of it, both from a a standpoint of geography and real uh, Greek history. But this is our Roman year, so we're particularly interested in a lot of the Roman characters, and our intention is to be starting with the Aeneid this year, which is the great epic poem for the Romans. a little like what the Iliad and the Odyssey are for the Greeks, but it was produced much later in their uh, history. No, the Iliad and the Odyssey served the same role uh, for the Romans as far as being foundational mythology, along with Hesiod's Theogony and the Works and Days and um, several other early Greek um, uh, literary masterpieces. Uh, the Aeneid was composed by Virgil, uh, the very, very tail end um, of what we would call the first century BC, um, uh, during the reign of uh, Octavian, who who most of us would probably know as the Emperor Augustus. Uh, and he, he didn't complete the work before his death. He wanted his um, uh, assistant to burn the manuscript rather than release it incomplete. Um, his assistant did not do so. So we have um, 12 of the 24 books that he intended to write, chronicling the journey of Aeneas, a hero of the Trojan War, uh, who flees the sack of Troy by the Greeks, and um, eventually comes through a number of tribulations that echo many of uh, Odysseus's uh, trials uh, to the shores of the Italian peninsula, ultimately to, to found uh, the Latin race who eventually become the Romans. Um, and there's there's some academic discomfort with the Aeneid viewing it purely as in, as early imperial propaganda. Um, that's a whole another discussion as to why uh, our academics today, particularly in the West, can't take literature at face value. But it's worth noting that no one in first century ancient Rome rejected Virgil's summary of the events. The biggest difference, I think, in some ways is the Aeneid is self-aware of what it is, whereas the Iliad and the, and the Odyssey are coming out of a bardic tradition that's not actively trying to create a kind of court poetry. I, I, that's the biggest difference. I, Regardless. That's, that's a whole discussion for another time, because yes. I, I really do break company with conventional academic wisdom on this one. So be it. It's a good opportunity to have an interesting conversation about the role that the poem plays. Yes. And more importantly, to dive into the world that is populated in the Greek and Roman imagination with all of the stories that are at the heart of their their tales about who they are and how they became what they were. So if you're studying Greek and Roman history and you want to start with myth, this is a great entry point. It gives you several stories to get interested in and it helps to build that out and the beautiful thing about it is that in terms of simplicity 10 and up uh younger if you can if you can reasonably play monopoly 
you can probably play this too. In some ways, the mechanics are simpler than Monopoly. In others, they're slightly more complicated. But generally, uh, it, it, we, we've had success playing it with, with kids as young as, as seven or eight. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, if they're not strong readers, uh, you may want to help them along. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a great... It, it, it plays well. It pay, plays quickly. Uh, although it can bog down um, in the the sub games that um, the the quest for the golden fleece and the um, navigation of the labyrinth to meet up with the minotaur uh, can represent those sub games can drag a little bit if the dice don't fall well. But even that provides another opportunity for discussing such things. That is a good point to play though. That because the victory conditions include multiple um, objectives. Another thing that it's going to be teaching more implicitly is going to be that development of strategic thinking, of having to think that to win, it's not enough to get the coins. It's not enough to defeat the perils. You've got four different things you're trying to achieve and balance. And some of it's all in the dice rolling and luck and in the way that cards are shuffled. But some of it is also keeping an eye on the fact that to win, there's a bunch of different things that you need to do, and that affects gameplay. Right. Do you have a specific example? Um, I was mostly thinking about the fact that, um, you know, luck plays a huge part on it. You've got your equivalents of do not pass go, do not collect $200 kinds of things. Um, and goodness knows I had my frustrations back in the days when we played a lot of Monopoly of the dice just wouldn't do what I wanted to. But I think that... Funny how dice are like that. Yeah. Very uncooperative. Horribly. Rather like the people who I have to manage in projects. <laughs> yes. Um, but the fact that as I'm playing around the board, I also have to pay attention to this quest for the Golden Fleece and pay attention to what's going on there, that means that I have to keep track of multiple objectives. Um, and so from a standpoint of complexity, it's going to be a point that as a parent you want to make sure that you understand how each of those parts of the game gets played before you start so that as you watch child frustration with the objectives you help to keep them in mind it's like okay good you're getting those coins don't forget about this part of the game right um and that's because one of our ongoing observations with children in games um is that when you discover a tactic you obsess about it. We, I was actually discussing this with a friend of mine the other day. Her son's into chess, um, like several of ours are. And he just discovered castling. And now he um, wants to castle all the time, even yes. when it's not appropriate. <laughs> because it's so cool. Yes. Yes. It's the only time you get to move two pieces at once. Uh-huh. And the thing to keep in mind is that when you're playing this game board... You're going to have your child probably fixate on one element of the gameplay, one of those four victory conditions. And so one of your warnings is pay attention to that. Help them learn to balance the different pursuit of the various victory conditions because they're going to need to actively be going after all four. That's a lot going on. It is a lot going on. Um, This one I was mentioning because of the Greek mythology, though, Um, even if you end up with a frustrating game, the nice thing is when you wrap up the game, you can say, wow, that was great. Anyone want to run around a bit? Maybe later we can read about, pick one of the characters that you ran into on the game board. My personal favorite, honestly, is, um, Nathaniel Hawthorne's Wonder Book for Boys and Girls, because I happen to like his retellings of the Greek and Roman myths, um, even better than the Dolaires to some degree. And what brought that to mind actually was seeing Midas on here because I love the way he retells Midas. Yeah, his retelling of Midas is is memorable and enjoyable. So one of the things I'd say from a keeping it fun standpoint is remember that this game is a lead-in into the study of the stories. So take the opportunity to match this with stories. And if you're seeing everyone getting frustrated with the game, that's the time when... Picking is time to say, you know, set it aside. Let's do a read aloud. You've got an opportunity to say, we're going to stay on this topic, but we're just going to do something different. That's actually a really good point in terms of content knowledge and skills development that this is one of those games where it's, it's really kind of 
easy to see what kind of content knowledge is the game going to help with, what kind of skills is the game going to help with. Um, watching, you know, a seven-year-old playing the game and all of a sudden that, that light bulb goes off where they realize that, you know, the sirens are the sirens or Achilles is Achilles or Medea is Medea or Medusa is Medusa, mm -hmm. that that they've made that connection that to us as an adult is obvious like we're playing this game by Jove and it's got all these Greco-Roman mythological figures and these stories and we'll read some of the stories and then you read Dallaire's or you read The Wonder Book or Tanglewood Tales or any of the other adaptations that are out there that are good, we see those connections, we take them for granted. They're not obvious mm -hmm. to a six or a seven or an eight or even a 10 or 12 year old if this is all new to them. And so the moment that, that, that switch flips, that, that you can see that light bulb go off in the head and they're like, Oh, this connects to that. And they, they begin to realize that you don't just have to take the relevant information from one location, that there's different ways to gather that and reinforce that information. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that I love how the game does reinforce it is that with some of the spots that you stop at along the board, they really are well chosen with their actions. They're well matched. So when you've got uh, Prometheus, for example. Who's one of the four corners. Um, you have, actually, he's not on the corner. He's right here. Oh. Yes. Uh, underneath that one, it notes, friend of man bids you rest. And that's an opportunity to ask, why does that have that particular direction on it? And that's a great place to look into say, well, who was Prometheus? What was his role? How did he help man? And you can go into who were the Titans. Um, and the war among the, um, the, that brought the Olympians to power and how Prometheus betrayed the, titan cause and he hid fire within a reed and brought it to men and gave men the gift of fire and from fire all technology proceeds mm -hmm. and then similarly you've got several perils around the board and you can start help building that knowledge of what were the the perilous things in those stories like Scylla and charybdis and from there, you end up with some of the most valuable me metaphors that you can use. Uh, I can't count the number of times that I've felt like I was trapped between Scylla and Charybdis with two bad choices. Um, yes, you can have your crew eaten by a creature that comes out of the wall of a rock, or you can have the whole ship go down in a whirlpool. Yes. There is nothing more lovely than being able to graphically describe just how awful those set of choices is. So, this is probably one of the easier games that we've been able to <coughs> recommend. Um, set of, setting aside the fact that you typically have to hunt this down on eBay, if you can find it, uh, it's not that hard to learn. If you can play Monopoly, this is going to be pretty much the same level of difficulty and very easy to pick up as a result. Um, it's perfect if you're studying Greek and Roman myths or Greek and Roman history and would be one of the ones that I think even those working with very young children would be able to bring it in, whereas several yeah. of the other games we're looking at are definitely more on that middle to high school level. Yes, absolutely. And so the thing I like is that if you have a wide range of children you're working with, whether you're in a co-op situation or you're a homeschooling family with children ranging from teens down to littles, the advantage to this game is that you can play it with everyone together. So it works well as a good family game. And it's light enough that it can be kept in the fun zone fairly easily. There's not a lot of obscure trivia buried in the rules. Uh, the rules themselves, I'm thumbing through the book here, it looks like they take up three sheets that are, what, five by seven? This is eight and a half by eleven. Bifolded, yeah. Bifold, you know, folded in half. So I mean the rule book itself is is um basically a uh what's that eight and a half by six mm -hmm. uh eight and a half by five and a half or something like that. Um so almost like a five by seven um It's about the size index of my card. Yeah. So but like 
it's it's not super tiny it's not super detailed actually playing the game and some of the special tiles it's all covered in three pages yes so again relatively lightweight and it can play very quickly Mm -hmm. um a few elements can get repetitive but that's not necessarily a bad thing especially when you're working with younger people and it's it's a joy to look at the the Board illustrations, I can't stress this enough, the board illustrations are a feast for the eyes. Yes. And as a result, it's a game that rewards repeated play, and it does so without aggressively demanding your attention. Mm -hmm. It does so simply by virtue of being pulled out and played over and over again. And I think from a standpoint of letting the game teach, the more times you can just play the game and allow that repetition to build up the associations, the easier your job becomes because you're just getting them familiar to where they're recognizing that you're, you're, you're helping to provide mental furniture. Yes. And so being able to readily recognize the sirens and Medusa as perils, that the various names of the Roman gods and what their sphere of influence was, To the point where they're the sort of thing you can easily recall for a crossword puzzle or a trivia test. But also so that you've got that recognition when you have a movie or a story that features them, you can readily recall who they were and what their role is easily. Right. So, definitely one that I would recommend one put into a just about any school year, but particularly the one that we're diving into. Um, and because it's light, it's the sort of thing you can pull out on a Sunday afternoon, play in an hour, hour and a half, and not stress a lot about. Yep, absolutely. So, we hope that you have enjoyed today's discussion. All of the games that we've mentioned today can be found in the show notes. Uh, but now we'd love to hear from you. Have you ever played uh, By Jove? Um, are there other games that you have played that uh, brought in characters from a mythology that you could think of. In fact, I just thought of one, but I'm waiting to hear back on them to find out if they're still in print. I may mention that next episode if I hear back from them. Oh, oh, way to tease. (laughs) Way to tease. Yes. Um, Regardless, uh, you can write to us at playedpod at gmail.com. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at playedpod. And we have a Facebook page at playedpodcast. Please tell us your thoughts, and until next time, thanks for listening. Take care. Bye.